One thing I'll point out with the processors is that U.S. cattle prices are particularly high compared to their international counterparts. And for companies that consume a lot of U.S. cattle, that may be causing issues. As an example, my most recent check shows Minerva Foods shares are only down about 12% over the last year, whereas JBS shares are down three times as much at a 36% decline. Now, both of those are Brazilian firms, like you mentioned, but JBS has a lot of plants in the U.S., whereas Minerva does. You're listening to IBKR Podcasts. Find more conversations at IBKRPodcasts.com. Please remember any trading discussions are for information purposes only and are not intended to portray recommendations. Please listen to further disclosures at the end of today's episode. Now, welcome to our show. Hello, and welcome to IBKR Podcasts. I'm Stephen Levine, Senior Market Analyst at Interactive Brokers. I'm your host for today's program. Sean McGovern, Vice President of Research at McAlinden Research Partners, joins us again for our ongoing series on agricultural commodities. McAlinden Research Partners is a highly informative independent investment strategy group, focuses on identifying alpha generating investment themes, and they've got a lot of great commentary on our Traders Insight platform. Very fortunate to have Sean here with us again. So welcome back, Sean. Yeah, always a pleasure. Glad to be here. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. And we're also lucky to be joined again by Jeff Praisman. He's our Senior Trading Education Specialist here at IBKR. Jeff's been using our Trader Workstation platform and tools along with his own research, which has provided us with some really terrific insights into the performance of futures prices, as well as related company stocks and options from coffee to wheat to corn and cocoa. You can check out our past podcast for some great information there. And he'll be helping us out today on the live cattle market. So excited to be talking about that topic today. In a way, it seems the live cattle market, it's a little similar to corn, isn't it? At least given the wide array of products that are produced. Corn produces a great number of products. I had no idea about when we did that. But live cattle market, too, it's not only responsible for beef, like hamburgers and steaks and so on, but also byproducts like oleo oil, and that's made from beef fat. It's used in margarine, for example. Then there's beef hide. It gets used to make leather goods. And even the bones and horns and hooves are used to produce things like piano keys and buttons and certain glues and marshmallows. I had no idea. So there's a very long list of uses, especially for these byproducts. They can go into everything from insulin to dish soap to candles, crayons, car wax, nail polish remover and deodorants to dog food. It's an incredibly long list and an incredibly large global industry that's responsible for millions of jobs. So like corn, as we did with those futures, we'll limit the scope of this discussion to what we or people who elect to consume meat might include in their dietary habits. This might be anything from steak and eggs to a bacon cheeseburger to a Whopper or Big Mac. Seems like there's a lot of people who are interested in that. And we'll be talking about meat processors and fast food restaurants as we take a look at live cattle futures. So let's start there. Sean, I see there are different types of cattle futures. There's live cattle, there's feeder cattle. Not sure what the difference is between these. What do commodities traders and investors actually get when they purchase a live cattle contract? Assuming we're talking about the CME's contract for live cattle, you're getting 40,000 pounds of cow. So (laughs) that's about uh, 18 metric tons. That is uh, if you're taking delivery. But I have a feeling that some of our listeners, it's going to be a little bit out of their reach to do that. So they better make sure they're keeping track of the expiration. Despite the fact you're signing up for 40,000 pounds, the contract is usually going to be quoted on a per pound basis or 100 pounds. Either way works the same way. Those contracts will be listed for six months of the year. It'll be February, April, June, August, October, and December. Right now, the front month is still the June contract since the trading continues all the way through the contract month and doesn't actually terminate until the last business day of each respective month for whichever month you're trading. That's live cattle. But you also mentioned feeder cattle, which is a little more interesting, I think. Live cattle, that's going to be older, more mature cows that have achieved a certain weight of well over 1,000 pounds. That makes them ready for harvest and slaughter. Feeder cattle are more recently weaned calves that are just being sent to the feedlot to get fattened up. So that's going to be an even bigger commitment of 50,000 pounds or 23 tons. The contract is only financially settled. So there's no physical delivery of the cattle associated with this. They're just going to be too small for slaughter. So it's not really any point of delivering them. And 
simple terms, you can think of the feeder cattle as eventually becoming the live cattle that will be harvested, but they're just not there yet. They're in the pipeline. Uh, settlement frequency is also more common, occurring in eight months rather than just six. And since there's no June contract in that mix, August is the current front month for that one. So feeder cattle is a little bit like future live cattle futures. Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay, got it, got it. And so Jeff, looking at the Trader Workstation, how are these live cattle futures performing? What trends do you see there? Yeah, so over the past year, the cattle futures have gained in price, you know, generally raising steadily and then taking a few steps back every few months. However, they popped around mid to late May and now they've slightly retreated again over the past few weeks. They've retreated, okay. But they're still pretty high, aren't they? Last time I looked, it was around 170 or so. I think they hit a high of uh, 175 prior to that. Sean, how do you account for this performance? What are some of the economic drivers or other catalysts affecting prices? I'm imagining the weather. I saw Texas as being something like 117, 120 degrees or something to that effect. It's crazy what's going on out there. First off, demand has remained relatively inelastic for beef, so consumers' desire to continue buying beef has not waned in spite of the constant price increases that we've seen and varying other economic conditions over the past few years. As we've discussed in the past, come rain or shine, recession or boom, people need to eat, and they appear to have decided beef is one of those things that they're just not willing to go without, at least not yet. Things are pretty simple on the supply side right now as well. The U.S. cattle herd right now is as thin as it's been in eight years going back to 2015, and they've been wiped out by persistent drought conditions throughout the Southwest. It's been particularly bad in regions like Texas and Oklahoma, and, and I don't think anybody would be surprised to learn that those are the two largest cattle producing states in the nation. That's where the droughts have maybe had the most significant and ongoing impact, but it's really been the entire Midwest that's been affected, really struggling with several waves of droughts since 2020. Uh, we're talking Nebraska, Missouri, Kansas, all the up along the Great Plains, there's been no relief lately. And when there's a lack of water, that's when culling begins. The pace of the slaughter might be expedited. Ranchers are going to look for ways to shrink the herd. As recently as March, the U.S. Drought Monitor described more than 80 percent of Texas as abnormally dry or worse, with nearly a fifth of the state falling into the extreme drought category. Yeah. Uh, the worst has passed for most of the state, with less than 2 percent of the state now experiencing extreme drought. But the majority of Texas's land remains at least abnormally dry. East Texas, which is a pretty big cattle farming region, is mostly drought free. But the leading beef producing counties up in the northern high plains, up by the Oklahoma panhandle, those remain some of the most heavily impacted by ongoing drought. And speaking of Oklahoma, two thirds of that state is considered abnormally dry or worse. And that's the Ooh. highest level in three months. Has this never happened before? Have we not experienced these kinds of drought conditions where culling of cattle was not needed to this extent? And these states were able to weather these kinds of extreme conditions. Believe it or not, it was worse last year. On the national level, things were worse last year. The culling really began back in 2020 because what you had was a closing down of the slaughterhouses and meat packing plants in the wake of COVID-19. And yeah. so when those reopened, there was a huge, almost like a glut of cattle. The prices actually fell in response to the initial lockdowns because of the perceived economic impact that that would have. So when they did open back up, you had a glut of cows and low prices already. And so the culling became very aggressive and the droughts have only made the culling even more aggressive. Even though I think a lot of ranchers don't want to cull anymore, they're running out of options because of the water situation. So how big exactly is this live cattle market globally? The global cattle population is going to be anywhere from 900 million to 1 billion heads, and a head just represents one cow. That's kind of the terminology of the industry. Uh, like we've seen in the U.S., the population has actually diminished over the past several years. If we go back to 2013 and before, we saw several years where the population surpassed 1 billion, but more recently we're seeing levels below 950 million. If we want to quantify the global industry in terms of beef production, you're talking about hundreds of billions of pounds of meat annually. Just the top 10 beef producing nations put out well over 100 billion pounds uh, last year. And who are they? That's the U.S. is certainly, I'm sure, among those top 10. But who are some of the bigger producers in the world? 
yeah, we're talking a lot about the United States already, and it's important to make sure we do put a lot of focus there since the U.S. is responsible for about 22 percent of the world's beef production in 2022. That's the largest share of any single nation. And whatever happens with the cattle population in the U.S., that's going to reverberate throughout the prices around the globe. Uh, weighing that number out, U.S. beef production was equivalent to almost 28 and a half billion pounds last year. Wow. Uh, if we look more closely at the data out of the USDA and their foreign agricultural service more specifically, we see Brazil is not that far behind us at this point. They're at 17.4% of that market. They're also the largest exporter of beef, making up 23.5% of exports. The second largest exporter, despite not really being one of the top five largest producers, is Australia. Huh. They're only responsible for less than 3.5% of total global output, but they represent almost 14% of all exports. Wow. So the cattle, herds, and beef output from these two countries has been stable to strong recently. And there was a report out of Rabobank that noted these two countries may be able to offset the declines in U.S. production and steady global beef supplies throughout the next 12 months. I haven't seen anything particularly concerning in regard to water supplies in either Brazil or Australia. Brazil is definitely drier than Australia, which appears to be enjoying plenty of rain, but below average temperatures have actually been of greater concern for Brazilian ranchers as several thousand cattle have actually been killed by the cold recently. Now, that alone is not really going to have a material impact on Brazil's total output in the grand scheme of things, but any kind of inclement weather is always something to watch out for in commodity markets. It's always something to take away from that. I remember the wildfires that Australia had, and I'm sure that that remains a risk. Well, one of the biggest impacts you saw from those wildfires was actually the smoke from those, kind of what we're seeing with the smoke coming down from Canada with the wildfires in Quebec, yeah. that smoke and those conditions, that went off of Australia and up into Asia and other parts of the globe and negatively impacted some of the crop growing out in different parts of the world. It's amazing what kind of effects or consequences these have that you right. don't consider when you think of the local damage or local catastrophes. We'll get to the outlook on the market a bit later, but since Interactive Brokers is a global company, I thought we'd take a look at some of the global meat processors. These are among the largest in the world. I understand the stocks of those that are publicly traded, companies like BRF, JBS, and Minerva Foods in Brazil, ConAgra, Hormel, Cisco, and Tyson here in the U.S., also Japan's NH Foods. These all seem to be on fairly depressed levels versus their recent highs. So, Jeff, what do you make of the activity there? Yeah, especially compared to when you look at the live cattle futures that are sort of almost trading near the yearly high as well. So the food processors seem to be trading lower than high right now. So the more that these live cattle futures are on the climb, it seems the relationship is the more depressed these meat processors' stocks become. Yeah, which makes sense because obviously the supply is getting more expensive for these meat processors. Yeah. And the input is becoming more expensive for the output where they have to send it off to restaurants or supermarkets or anyone else that is buying the supply of beef once they've processed it. One thing I'll point out with the processors is that U.S. cattle prices are particularly high compared to their international counterparts. And for companies that consume a lot of U.S. cattle, that may be causing issues. As an example, my most recent recent check shows Minerva Foods shares are only down about 12% over the last year, whereas JBS shares are down three times as much at a 36% decline. Oh. Now, both of those are Brazilian firms, like we mentioned, but JBS has a lot of plants in the U.S., whereas Minerva doesn't. Uh, lots of processors are struggling with high cattle costs and maybe having issues passing those on to restaurants or whoever's buying in the wholesale market, but I think the cattle pricing in the U.S. certainly has been a larger detriment. It's very interesting to me because these costs don't seem to be affecting certain fast food companies. Some popular fast food companies are seeing their shares go higher recently, right? McDonald's, Wendy's, Restaurant Brands International, they operate Burger King, among others, like Tim Hortons and Popeyes, Yum Brands, which has Taco Bell and Habit Burger Grill. There are others as well. So the processing companies appear to be suffering while fast food is benefiting. And I was looking at the U.S. CPI, and I know you mentioned this in your report, Sean, the Consumer Price Index, that the average price per pound of ground beef rose to a new record high in May, up 3.6% over the prior month, and a little more than 25% since the start of 2021. So that's even bigger than the 17.7% increase over that same period for all meats, poultry, fish, and eggs category in that report. So how can we explain this? How can we explain that on the back of this inflation, on the back of higher live cattle food prices, at least from, say, McDonald's, 
They've pretty recently raised the prices on certain of their menu items, and their global comparable sales were up over 12.5% in the first quarter. It's like Coca-Cola, Hershey, which we talked about in previous podcasts. It seems that demand is still there. So same questions for Jeff. What are we seeing with these fast food stocks and those relationships with the meat processors that we talked about? What conditions are driving the fast food sector prices outside of demand? I mean, the cost must be higher for them. Yes. First of all, you're right. The fast food stocks are trading at or near their 52-week highs. It seems at least for the time being, they've been able to successfully pass off the increased cost to either the consumer and continue to thrive. But also remember that many of these fast food restaurants are franchised. So corporate may also be able to pass off some of those costs to the franchisees through their product. And also, I think a lot of these restaurants might have become an affordable alternative for people who may be trading down their restaurant choices. So in other words, Maybe people who would might be going down to a you know a sit down restaurant with their kids are maybe now instead going to a McDonald's or a Wendy's because while it's more expensive than it used to be, for what those families are used to, it's actually a cheaper alternative than their prior dining experience. Sean, do you think it's going to keep going in this direction? What's your outlook for the live cattle futures, the live cattle markets? Do you foresee this these conditions where culling is? continually needed, that the thin supply on the ground is going to continue? Yeah, our focus is really going to be on the water supply. And the water supply is not only thinking about drinking, you're thinking about also what are the conditions on the range like? What are the conditions on the pasture like? And in the United States, range conditions were horrible last year, as I already mentioned. And we just got the first national look from the USDA in May, kind of give us a what to expect throughout the summer as far as range and pastures look. It's, it's a little bit better, but Only 33% of pastures are rated good to excellent, while a larger 37% is poor to very poor. That's national, and as we mentioned earlier, not all states are equal in their cattle production. If we go back to Texas, for instance, we're at 26% of pasture land rated good to excellent. That's up from 15% a year ago, but it's still below average, and conditions have actually deteriorated significantly in most of the other big cattle states like Oklahoma, Missouri, Kansas, Nebraska. All of those are experiencing double-digit percentage declines in good to excellent conditions. There is a little bit of consolation in there that the western United States, specifically Arizona, Utah, Nevada, California, they're seeing really solid improvements in pasture quality, but their combined output, all four of those states, it's only 1.7 million cows or so, which is equivalent to maybe just one of the top five powerhouse states like Nebraska. And so given the smaller U.S. herd, it's not surprising that the slaughter rate's been trailing 2022 levels through May already. The USDA sees beef production at 27 billion pounds in 2023, while next year's beef production is likely to be 24.8 billion. That's a year-over-year reduction of almost 2.3 billion pounds. Um, Each of those figures is also a significant decline from record U.S. beef production in 2021, which was well over 28 billion pounds. And the real question at this point is how much of these supply-side issues are already priced into the contract. You know, the drought conditions are not a surprise anymore. We know traders will be looking at the longevity of the dryness, whether they're getting better or worse. And we've seen that prices have already come off of the record highs throughout the past week. But there could be more upside if the water supplies and other weather dependent conditions take a turn for the worse throughout the summer. And I'll just add when it comes to the fast food guys, If we talk about that, I think it comes back to the inelasticity of demand we mentioned with beef in general and an improvement in the outlook for economic growth that's kind of been boosting stocks across the board recently. It's just a really positive macro factor, but I do think both of them are finite and stocks can't continue to rise or hope to outperform the benchmarks if that's what's driving them. McDonald's, you mentioned, it's a really interesting example since it wasn't until last quarter they finally saw some pushback to their price hikes. And the company explained that primarily as items purchased per transaction, that metric was beginning to fall off by just low single digit percentages. And an interesting trend we might begin to see is a shift back to eating at home as those prices continue to mitigate. You mentioned the CPI, and it should be noted that the index's food at home component, that's been rising by double digits until pretty recently, outpacing the restaurant other prepared food prices. It was only up 58 percent in May, whereas data showed food away from home was still up 8.3 percent. And if we see more resistance to restaurant food inflation, I think that could be tied to the smaller price increases that we've seen for food made at home. 
not only do you have to maybe spend a little bit more at the grocery store for these products, but you also have to make it yourself. And that's just like an added cost in some ways, I, su I suppose. But maybe also you could think about shrinkage in terms of the menu items that places like McDonald's sells. And so maybe instead of a Big Mac, they'll have like a Little Mac or... A <laughs> medium Mac. Yeah, something like that. They'll have it in different sizes. They had chicken nuggets, right? So maybe they'll have like, you know... Uh, Big Mac nuggets, which would Big Mac, nuggets. Big Mac <laughs> sliders. I think that would probably work. Okay, so it doesn't look like such a bright outlook for the live cattle futures market in the sense that it's going to cost meat processors more. And at the end of the day, it sounds like it's just going to continually feed inflation in the way that we've been seeing, which also is not such a great sign, I would say. But Let's switch gears a bit because we did have a listener who wrote in about our Cuckoo for Cocoa Futures podcast. It's not cattle related. It's a sort of postscript or an addendum to our discussion about that podcast. And we had a comment from a listener listening to your cast on Cocoa Markets and wanted to point you in the direction of the 800 pound gorilla in the cocoa room, heavy metals found in the cocoa supply. So for this listener and others who may be concerned about this topic, I thought we'd do them a disservice if we didn't address it. So I, I did some research and I found that Consumer Reports had a few pieces actually, one as early as December of last year, and it found that certain brands had high levels of cadmium, such as Lint's Excellence Dark Chocolate, 70% cocoa. And I do look for a benchmark of like 70% cocoa. That's one that had it. It is a maker of chocolate bars I like. Dove's Promises Deeper Dark Chocolate, also 70% cocoa. Tony's Choco Lonely Dark Chocolate, 70% cocoa. Godiva's Signature Dark Chocolate, 72% cacao, which I remember you talked about, Sean. Who's Organic Simple Dark Chocolate, 70% cacao. And Hershey's Special Dark Mildly Sweet Chocolate, among others. These were all very high in lead content. I was shocked. So I want to hear from you, Sean, about this particular risk to cocoa. To what extent does this impact the cocoa market? Does it have any bearing on the fundamentals, say, on the cocoa economics? There are other questions. Is it something that's been deterring consumers in a significant way? I mean, I'm looking at the earnings from, say, Hershey. I haven't seen it, but maybe it would have been more. Maybe there would have been more organic sales. I don't know. Maybe the figures would have been even higher without this concern. So what are your thoughts on this, Sean? Heavy metals in the cocoa supply. I'd like to hear from you too, Jeff. Well, I guess it's something I'm going to have to think about a little bit, but <laughs> that's on a personal level. Yeah. As far as the market goes for the commodity itself, I'm not sure it really impacts it all that much. You know, a lot of foods have some amount of heavy, toxic metals in them. And, you know, toxicity is, is really, it's on a spectrum, right? Obviously, just because something's toxic doesn't mean consuming it is necessarily going to cause damage to you, right? It really comes down to the moderation. I honestly feel that the sheer amount of calories in the chocolate that you would need to consume to really harm your health with the cadmium, that would probably be just as big of a threat to your health as the cadmium itself. <laughs> you true. know what I mean? Yeah. So cadmium is a carcinogen, but ironically enough, a lot of nutritional organizations out there consider red meats like beef, which we're just talking about to be a carcinogen as well. Uh, fish, they contain lead, even our own bodies, they contain some amount of lead, particularly in your teeth and bones. And now I'm not any authority on nutrition beyond counting my own calories. But uh, the reality is so many foods expose us to certain chemicals and there are FDA regulations that broadly cover these exposures in the food supply. So I would say personal moderation is really the big thing there. And I can't imagine that it's going to be impacting the cocoa market all that much insofar as what we're talking about with commodities. Yeah, well, that makes a lot of sense. I'm worried about Jeff now, though, because he eats bags and bags of Halloween candy. So I'd love to hear about his take on it. If you saw this in the Consumer Reports piece, Jeff, I think that you also would probably be a little bit concerned, I'm sure. Well, I am a little bit concerned because I basically just finished a bag of bite-sized Hershey uh, <laughs> chocolates uh, before this podcast. <laughs> so th one. this is actually news to me, but I agree with Sean where a lot of this stuff is, and I want to discount the study, but you know, a lot of this stuff, if it's occurring naturally, I don't think it's nearly as bad as people make it out to be. Whereas, you know, I think in my opinion, something occurring naturally in the chocolate is much different than something that's occurring not naturally in, in a substance. So I, I do agree that, you know, moderation 
is is good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, I, and I try to follow that, but again, as we know from the previous podcast, me and chocolate go together pretty well. Yeah, you know, there's something to be said about maybe innovation in the way that we process these foods. I know her, she has actually made a statement about this. They've come out and said that they, I mean, they already have certain processes to remove certain amounts of cadmium and other metals from the cocoa before they put it into the chocolate. And a lot of people, I'm not sure they're really aware of how it actually, these metals get into the chocolate and it's different for both. So cadmium, it's in the soil and it gets taken up into the cocoa through the roots, right? It's just like any other way that you consume food, your body would probably have some trace amount of it, right? Lead's a little bit different though. When they bring the cocoa out of the ground, they put it out in the sun to dry for a few days. And what happens is that there's all this soil getting swept around by the wind and that lead ends up getting on the cocoa as it's out drying. So both of these ways that cocoa gets exposed to these metals is just through the same soil that it grows from. I'm not really sure you can have cocoa without having these metals because there's a reason it grows where it does. That's a very specific kind of soil. It's a very specific kind of climate, and it becomes very difficult to eliminate those factors, unless maybe you start talking about genetic editing of these uh, of these plants or something, but that's a whole other topic. Well, we should talk about that at some point, but if I knew nothing about it at all, and I looked at that Consumer Reports piece, I would be somewhat frightened just by looking at the levels. And I can understand how our listener picked up on it and wanted to address it. But I feel a little bit better listening to both of you. And I do like the point about the USDA not approving these products unless they felt as if there were some safety risks or hazards to our health that would preclude them from being sold. So all good. And yes, I don't need enough chocolate probably to substantiate it, at least not anymore. Uh, this is really great. Sean, Jeff, again, thank you both very much for taking the time to do this. It was extremely informative. For our listeners, you can read more commentary and market analysis at IBKR Traders Insight at our newly launched IBKR campus at ibkrcampus.com. You can keep abreast there about topics we've discussed today, as well as a wide range of other news critical to your investment decisions. McElinden Research Partners has a host of articles on several themes, from central banks and gold buying to issues involving cybersecurity. Please contact Rob Davis for more details at rob at com. This will all be in the show notes. For a full list of financial education offerings, visit the IBKR campus, where, as always, all of our educational material is provided to the public at no cost. Additionally, I wanted to mention that since we're on the topic of agricultural commodities and futures, Andrew Wilkinson, Director of Trading Education here at IBKR, also recently spoke with Dan Bossi, President of Ag Resource, about the corn, soybeans, and wheat markets ahead of the June 30th USDA crop report. I encourage our listeners to check that out as well. And wherever you listen to your podcast, please rate and review us. Love to hear your feedback. And until next time, I'm Stephen Levine with Interactive Brokers. Thanks for listening to IBKR Podcasts. As always, we have more episodes at ibkrpodcasts.com. And if you're interested in learning more about interactive brokers, visit ibkr.com. We offer more trading education material, such as webinars at ibkrwebinars.com, financial and economic commentary at tradersinsight.news, market-related courses at tradersacademy.online, and quant-related articles at ibkrquant.com. Options involve risk and are not suitable for all investors. For more information, read the characteristics and risks of standardized options, or ODD, which may be accessed through the link found in the show's notes or podcast description page. Futures are not suitable for all investors. The amount you may lose may be greater than your initial investment. Before trading futures, please read the CFTC Risk Disclosure. A copy and additional information are available at ibkr.com. The analysis in this material is provided for information only and is not and should not be construed as an offer to sell or the solicitation of an offer to buy any security. To the extent that this material discusses general market activity, industry or sector trends, or other broad-based economic or political conditions, it should not be construed as research or investment advice. To the extent that it includes references to specific securities, commodities, currencies, or other instruments, those references do not constitute a recommendation by IBKR to buy, sell, or hold such investments. The material does not and is not intended to take into account the particular financial conditions, investment objectives, or requirements of individual customers. Before acting on this material, you should consider whether it is suitable for your particular circumstances and, as necessary, seek professional advice.